when you have an idea and uh, you have a question and then you manage to operationalize it in an experiment, then you collect data and it's, it's really like, um, like an exciting movie because you want to know what's the outcome and you want to analyze the data and you're waiting, you run your program uh, to, to, an to analyze the data and then you're waiting for the, for the output, like waiting for an ending of an exciting movie because you want to know was my hypothesis correct or, or not? And it's really, really exciting. And this, this thrill of the moment when you get the output file, you look at it, it's like, yes or no? <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating and exciting. When people ask me where I'm from, I say, I don't know. <laughs> well, of course, I, I have Polish passport, so in that sense I'm Polish, but mentally, I don't know. Um, then I lived in Germany for many years, but again, I don't think I feel German. Um, then I lived in Sweden for some time, I definitely, it was way too short to feel Swedish. So at the end of the day, when people ask me where I'm from to understand my nationality, I can't answer that question, there's no simple answer. So I decided to always answer to them that I'm from academia, because I think Academia is really kind of a bubble um, um, environment and I think that's where I belong best. Uh, science or maybe academia is really part of our identity and if I was to identify myself with anything that would be really like academ academic environment and, and science. I remember that I was more uh, interested in philosophy, philosophical questions. That's why I chose philosophy at first. But I think I didn't really understand how actually difficult it is to do philosophy because you don't have the data. So you're kind of on your own with your ideas. Having a question, getting the data, trying to understand if um, the output is in line with your hypothesis or not. That part I think is, uh, is uh, something that, that really made me understand, okay, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. In my ERC project, I'm interested in examining um, human social cognition with the use of artificial agents, embodied artificial agents, that is humanoid robots. And um, <clears throat> the reason why I choose humanoid robots to study human social cognition is that uh, humanoid robots offer um, kind of a possibility of having interactive scenarios with actually a presence of of an agent, embodied presence, that can um, change something in our environment. So robots can manipulate objects, can, can manipulate our joint environment, so we're really present together in the, in the shared environment in contrast to stimuli on the screen. Um, on the other hand, they still offer a lot of experimental control in contrast to having a human-human interaction where you can't make a human behave in exactly the same way 100 times repetitively to measure certain mechanisms of social cognition. So here's the robot and here's the sort of human <laughs> and they should interact. And the human has um, EEG electrodes on, on its head. Um, that's because what I'm interested in is measuring the um, kind of neural um, correlates of social cognition during human-robot interaction. And uh, I'm using neurocognitive methods, and one of them is, is EEG. Another method that we use in our research is um, eye tracking, for example, and eye tracking glasses, which I haven't brought here, but this is to, to represent the methodology and the topic. The main question is how much our uh, mechanisms of social cognition that we use with other humans in social interactions, how much do they depend on attributing mental states to others? If I treat um, a humanoid robot as an artifact that has um, like a coffee machine, um, right? Um, I probably will not engage in any social interactive, my brain will not um, engage social cognition in such a, such a case. But when I explain behavior of a robot with reference to its beliefs, desires, uh, what it wants, what it likes, um, then 
it's very likely that I will actually start evoking those mechanisms of social cognition because I treat it as a more social agent that's interacting with me. So I'm interested in, um, in seeing whether there are certain patterns of behavior that will make us think of this robot as being, um, yeah, as its behavior being a result of mental states or I'll just treat it as a programmed machine, as I say, like a coffee machine. And um, an example of, of that is, um, like imagine that we're talking here and then suddenly there would be a loud sound somewhere or someone opens the door, yeah? We'll, I'll probably turn my head there and you'll probably also attend there. And this is a very human-like behavior because um, our attention, attention being a mental state, is attracted by uh, the stimulus. Now imagine a robot that is doing a task um, for the completion of that task, it's actually very distracting if a robot suddenly moves and uh, looks there. So for, in terms of functionality of a robot, it wouldn't make sense to have such a mechanism. But if it did turn its head there, it would be very human-like and you would be likely to attribute some mental states to its behavior. If we can um, give information to roboticists, maybe guidelines on how this behavior should be like, I think that would be very useful to design robots that are very well attuned to humans and that interact with humans in a very social and intuitive way.